Hello and welcome back, Eddie Radosovich, George Stoya here from the Suterscoop.com studios, Josh McQuish, it's a, another recruiting report, another Oklahoma commitment to talk about. Emmett Jones continues an absolute tear as he is uh, kind of responsible for maybe one of the better uh, wide receiver classes in the country. We'll get to that here in a second with the uh, Monday commitment of Cortez Mills. It's a good time to join Suterscoop.com, though. We got a good plan for you. All you got to do is take care of uh, the promo here. One month or two months, excuse me, for $1, promo code OU1, $1, two months, promo code OU1. And I can't believe that we are already to the point in the summer where we're talking about SEC Media Day. Big 12 preseason poll came out today. We don't care about that necessarily. No, we don't care about it but, at all. But uh, what an uh, incredible experience that was yesterday over and I guess here in Norman, technically, all over the place, really, all over the state, starting yesterday morning in Oklahoma City and Tulsa, and then all, obviously on down to uh, Norman yesterday. Yeah, it was hot as hell. It was. Uh, but a lot of fun. Um, I actually thought it was a pretty good turnout, considering the heat and sure. it being a Monday. It, well, and it sounds like as we left on Monday night from uh, the field, it sounds like people were starting yeah. to kind of mill about. The sun was obviously going down. It was getting a little bit cooler. So really nice scene. Congratulations to everybody. I know Leah Beasley Worked a lot on that. You saw her uh, on the right here on the Soonerscoop.com YouTube page on yep. Friday. George, you went over and we talked to her. Uh, it was it was a smashing success. And, and congrats to us. We yeah. went on the Fine Bomb we show. We did go on the Fine Bomb show and, and we crushed it. Apparently, Paul Feinbaum's like one of my best friends in the SEC. So we look forward to working <laughs> with our new colleague, Mr. Feinbaum, over the uh, you know, next century, if you will. Uh, that was a lot of fun, though. It yeah. was a lot of fun. We had a great time. Was, I mean, it was. It was cool. It was cool, and um, you know, I didn't realize how much Paul knew you. I didn't either, and maybe a little bit nervous, but uh, I think it was all in good fun, I think. I'm going to choose to believe that he really, really likes me, and I have a new best friend. Lost in the mix on Monday. Josh, hello, welcome. How are we? Uh, guys, I'm good. You know, just um, living, kind of settling in after all that travel of the summer dad kids at home life. So, sure. you know, seeing you all just living life on ESPN, you know, it, no, no jealousy, none at all. Like just, just, you know, uh, going on, going on runs. I, I'm actually literally behind the camera. I have my nine-year-old asking me if she can have some orange crush while Absolutely. we're doing this. So that that's, that's my life right now. Mix a little vodka in there. It'd be a nice <laughs> little uh, Tuesday afternoon <laughs> on Monday though. Still sleep. We'll pause for Casey Anthony because that went south. I don't think it's very funny. I'm showing but, Tiffany this video. Yeah. Well, I'm, talk to you, Eddie. I'm trying to keep you out of jail. I'm trying to keep you out of prison. You see? On Monday, we did have another commitment, the 20th commitment in the 2025 class, Homestead, Florida wide receiver Cortez Mills. And this was, Josh, I think going back to the official visit weekend, something that had been building over the last couple of weeks. It was something that we had talked about last week in terms of, holy hell, was Oklahoma really going to take a fifth wide receiver? And sure enough, they did on Monday with the commitment. Yeah, you know, I was talking to Josh Newberg, you know, right after that, he had made that announcement on the On3 uh, YouTube channel. And I think this was just a matter of Cortez Mills was too good to say no to, guys. Like, I, I don't think the plan was ever to take five wide receivers. But when they were looking at three, and I, I think it's kind of like, again, I, I with, with my kids, like, you, you go somewhere and they're like, I can't make the choice. And you're like, I do I want to make them go through this or do I just want to let them have both toys and we, we can go forward? I think Emmett Jones just got to the point where he was like, I don't want to make the choice between Marcus Harris and Cortez Mills. Like, I want them both. And that's what Oklahoma did. And I, I think it's a sign of, what he's doing, guys, because, like, look at it. I, I tweeted something about this this morning. This is only the fourth time in the modern era of recruiting, so it's basically since 2000, that Oklahoma has landed three top 250 wide receivers in the country. And you got one from Florida, one from California, and one from your backyard in Elijah Thomas. So it's really, really impressive. And then you look at the impact it's had on this class. Three of OU's top seven commitments at this moment, and it'll change, but as, as of this point in time, three of the seven are wide receivers. Now, 
That's not exactly the way you want that to be, but it's a sign of how well Emmett Jones is doing right now. Real quick, we'll go through all five of them just to uh, add a little bit of perspective. Elijah Thomas, who you mentioned, obviously out of the state of Oklahoma, one of the top players in the 2025 class, one of, I think, our favorites just in terms of what we've been able to see of him live. Marcus Harris, who committed about two weeks ago, I believe, number one wide receiver in California. Cortez Mills obviously adds his name to the list on Monday. Emmanuel Choice, as well as Grayson Harris, uh, a dual sport kid out of uh, Texas that is a little bit of the forgotten guy when you're talking about this fivesome. But once again, you're talking about one of the better classes Oak was brought in, as you kind of just illustrated, Josh. I, I think that it's just so impressive. Sorry, Josh, I'm cutting you off. Uh, no, no, you're I, He fine. gets a little you're FaceTime, fine. the second FaceTime with Paul Feinbaum, uh, and he thinks he can cut everybody off. It's, it's a superstar treatment. I got to just wait. Oh, I got you. I, I just think it's impressive what Emmett Jones has been able to do. I mean, you guys joked yesterday in our group DMs just like it's becoming the Emmett Jones recruiting report. And, yeah. and I think that for him to be able to do what he's done in his short time at Oklahoma – and I, I just, Josh, like, am surprised they're taking five guys. And like you said, I think they just had so many guys that wanted to come that they're like, we'll just take them all. Now, I do I do want to ask, and I don't want to be the negative Nelly here, Josh, but, like, is there any chance any of these guys say, man, that's a lot of that's a lot of, a lot of guys in at the receiver position coming in? I don't think so. Because what I think is interesting, like, you look at it, and I, I talk about this all the time, guys. I, I, I know people are like, oh, you know, drink. Josh is going to bring up this reference. But it is. It's a basketball team. You've got your big guy in Emmanuel Choice. You've got your point guard with Grayson Harris. Like, And then you kind of have your your wings with, you know, Marcus Harris, Elijah Thomas, and, uh, and Cortez Mills. So I think you have some variety in the way they play. And I, I would say, interestingly enough, the two that remind me the most of each other are Elijah Thomas and Cortez Mills. Kind of... Same frame, same strengths as players. Um, I, I think Elijah's maybe a little more just inherently explosive, while Cortez Mills is so smooth and easy. Cortez has some CD in there. Like, you'll watch his tape, and you see some stuff, and you're like, I, I don't want I, – I, I fell short of making that comparison because I know how, how much pressure that kind of puts on a guy to be that kind of guy. But I, you do see some of that. Like, his strength in the air – I, I put in the story, the commitment breakdown, and I've talked about it before on here, the picture of him standing next to Emmett and Marcus Harris, where he's at least three inches taller than Marcus Harris, yet his arms are every bit as long, maybe longer, you know, like, or lower in the picture, I guess you'd say, than uh, than Marcus Harris, who's a very long athlete himself. It's, it's just kind of crazy, some of his physical tools. I, I really like him a lot and wouldn't, be at all surprised if he ends up a guy that moves kind of into that top 100, um, you know, maybe even top 75 range, because he's a guy that's really blown up through the spring. Uh, but as far as what your question is, George, I don't think any of these guys are in real jeopardy. This is Cortez Mills' uh, junior highlight film that we're watching mm -hmm. right now at Homestead uh, there in Florida. Is it also one of those things, too, that maybe, like, Maybe this is a situation that Emmett Jones has earned a little bit of, uh, not necessarily respect. I wouldn't put it that way, but he gets a little bit of leeway. It's like, okay, you want to take five? You've been recruiting well enough? This is kind of like a bonus gift for you. You get that fifth wide receiver. Well, and, and I do, guys, like you look at it. Okay, like you look at our scholarship board that's up. You've got Andrew Anthony, Jalil Farouk, JV, and Hester in the senior class. And, you know, again, Hester, we, we I know there's some debate of, you know, what his scholarship status is right now. But then – you expect this is probably a one and done situation for Dion Burks. So you're looking at three or four spots right there. And then it, you know, if somebody goes off, say Nick Anderson just has a humongous year. Okay. Maybe something could happen there. I, I just think this seems really big, but at the same time, I think when you're starting to have the production that they're having at wide receiver, you're going to see some guys go and you're also going to see some older guys, say, hey, I, I, I'm never going to have a role here, especially with what's coming behind me. I'm going to go move on and find something different. So I think this is, to me, this is how you should be recruiting. Like, we're going to put pressure constantly on those upperclassmen. Like, if you're not producing, man, this isn't the spot for you. Like, I, I think that's that's something, Eddie, I know you and I have talked about dating back to Riley. Yeah. Like, that's something that should have been going on to, if you're going to live in this portal era and you're going to have to deal with some of the negatives, Make it a positive for you to where you can always create space if you need to. That's that's almost kind of like the, uh, the single encapsulation or like the long-winded version of 
when what something that we had heard, you know, going all the way back into August of last year and maybe even the first season in Brent Venables, uh, you know, era, whatever you want to call it here in Norman, that's competitive depth. I mean, that is the literal definition of what they're trying to build. And, and I think in today's age of the transfer portal, and especially at a p- position like receiver where you have a lot of guys and a lot of talented guys, you're going to see that position almost every year, at least one or two guys probably enter the portal at that position, especially if you're recruiting four or five guys every single year in the class and as talented as these guys are like it wouldn't shock me if even some of these true freshmen at OU like one of them enters the portal or uh, an older guy enters the portal that maybe doesn't have the season that they anticipate so I think you've got to take you know four or five guys every single year and when you have a chance to get as many talented players as OU did at that position you don't say no it's kind of like the offensive line which we'll get into here in a little bit like if you can get five or six, you know, high caliber players, you do it because it, it, you just can't come up. You don't come along that kind of talent every single day. I know it's a sign of the times, Josh, but it's still a little bit crazy to me to look up on July 2nd. Oklahoma has 20 players in its 2025 class. I mean, we talk about this thing kind of getting to the end and you start looking at 2026. That's the reality of the situation here. I'm just so excited for George to start learning those 2026 20, names. It's gonna have to. He's gonna have to do August first. He's getting ready for team camp. He's dealing with all that stuff, and he's like, "Who are these guys?" Josh is talking about because that's coming, guys. Like, I mean, th- this class could absolutely be done by August first. Like that. That is very much in the cards. I, I would say, probably likely. I mean, like now again, I think Brent Venables is a big believer in that senior riser that you know that sometimes happens. We've seen it, you know, dating back. To Brent's, you know, time as a defensive coordinator with a guy like Jeremy Beal that really came on in his senior year of high school and obviously had a great career at Oklahoma. So I think there's always that little wiggle room that Oklahoma wants to allow for. And again, we all know flips are going to happen. I mean, I, you know, George is asking me about the five wide receiver commitments. As things stand right now, it seems good. Could something go wrong and change all of that? Sure, absolutely. So I think that's something we'll have to watch. But I mean, for the numbers that I expect to happen, I do. I think Oklahoma is going to be sitting probably 24, 25. And I, Eddie, I think we can finally wave goodbye to that 21, 22 stuff that I kept yeah. hearing all spring and was like, that doesn't add up. The math never added on that. Sure. And I just never understood why that was the narrative. I, I again, and I think it's also to give OU fans some, you know, some joy, some excitement, whatever. I do think that was the plan. I think Oklahoma has had a, has done better then maybe they expected to with some higher end guys that they've just said, I, we can't live under that number and turn the kind of guys away that we have a chance to sign here. And that's even kind of, and if we, we can kind of dive into this, we're talking about 24, 25 guys. That's with, with losing out on Max Granville and Smith, the who committed to Texas on, on Monday, which I mean, I, you know, I think those were two guys that they would have definitely taken. Well, there's George to be the 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 gray cloud. Man. I know, I'm trying I know. to build people up, and he's like, they lost two. But no, you're right. I mean, that wasn't the plan. And I, you know, what's interesting, George, on Tuesday morning, you've seen Oklahoma start to make some edge offers in the class of 2026. I don't think that's coincidental. I think Oklahoma, they'll again, they're going to look around. They're going to see if somebody emerges. A couple years ago, Taylor Wine is a really good example of sure. a guy that had a great senior year. OU got involved, took him late. Um, I, if something like that were to emerge, that's absolutely in the cards. But I think it's a sign of, okay, we didn't get a couple guys we needed. They're still waiting on Cade. I think it's Pietschak or something yep. like that, the, the big guy from from North Dakota. Yeah, well, They're still waiting for that decision. I think that's going to go their way. But beyond that, and then obviously Floyd Bucard and a couple of other defensive linemen they're still involved with, there's not a lot of dominoes left to fall on that defensive line as things stand. So I think you're just starting to see them pivot to 2026, and it kind of tells you where those numbers are, where they're saying, you know, what's in play is kind of what's in play at this point. Just for clarity's sake, Max Granville committed to Penn State, Smith Aragvo committed to Texas. So that that's where it's at. There are a couple 2025 targets still available, still on the board, and possibly even as soon as this weekend, Marion Robinson, uh, the defensive back out of Arkansas, is uh, set to make his announcement on, I believe it's Saturday, Josh, and it sounds extremely yes. positive for Oklahoma. Yeah, I, I really like where Oklahoma is with Marion. Um, this has felt, you know, guys, I mean, 
we, we've talked about it being an Emmett Jones show, but guys, I, and I think we've done a good job of Brandon Hall deserves a lot of credit. He's fought some serious battles for Oklahoma. Uh, you know, obviously getting Marcus Wimberly. Guys, Marcus Wimberly was kind of headed to Michigan when OU got involved there. So I know there's been turnover and Jim Harbaugh's not at Michigan anymore, but that's still the defending national champions. And of, in a state that, frankly, Oklahoma has not recruited well at all sure. through the years in Arkansas. That That's just been a wasteland. Probably, I would say the hit percentage is probably the lowest of any state I can currently think of. Like Because almost anywhere else, there's been you know at least a 10% hit rate. Oklahoma's uh, really, I mean, Arkansas has just been an anomaly that they've had no luck there. Really, Trey Norwood being the exception. And I guess, and uh, uh, Stacey Wilkins. So, you know, it's been um, one for two. It's been tough. So, for Oklahoma to go in and take this win, uh, you know, if they can close a Marion Robinson on Saturday, I, I think that's huge. And you get two guys in Wimberley and Robinson, both from Arkansas, they know each other. They're going to come into the room together. I I, I think that that is just, uh, like I said, Robinson's a guy on tape I like a lot. I I see a lot of ability. He's a guy that, and I, some OU fans may say like, oh, he's the replacement to Jonah Williams. No, Oklahoma liked Marion Robinson, whether they were getting Jonah Williams, whether they weren't. He was a guy that they wanted. They liked him a lot. Um, I see him as like a big, long, free safety kind of guy, um, kind of, kind of in the mold of like a Broadney pool for those that can remember that far back in OU. Like I, I see that kind of range, that kind of size. I, I, I just, I think he's a guy, um, frankly, I think on three, he's got him a little underrated. I, I like that get a lot for Oklahoma. If they can finish out and kind of beat out Oregon here at the wire. What is the, uh, this might be a little off topic, but the Jonah Williams situation, especially with, um, yeah, it's you know, been, the baseball stuff has been interesting with the, the movement for uh, Jim Schlossnagel. Does that open the door for Texas as he makes his move to Austin? It's uh, it's certainly been interesting, Josh. You think I, I've got to think it levels the field a little bit because it did. It felt like AM had kind of pulled away from everybody else. Now, it's tough to know because obviously, you know, the, the early guy taking the AM job. There is, there's going to be some connection. There's going to be some, you know, some overlap there as far as Jonah knowing him and have those relationships. Because I know, and Eddie, I know you know better than me, but here in the last, you know, four or five hours, several of the big A and M guys have left the portal and are, you know, stick, staying at A and M. Yeah. So that's a good sign. But at the same time, you almost pull like maybe, you know, if you're an OU fan, like you got to pull that Schnossnagel kind of helps you a little bit there, like just to soften that lead. And then say, okay, may, you know, maybe he will take an official visit. Because, guys, the last time I spoke with Jonah, everybody kind of wrote this off, and I, and I include myself in that. But he was like, I'm going to take an official to OU during the season. That That's my current plan. If that's the case, he's taken officials just about everywhere else that would matter, and it might give OU, like, the last chance. Like, yeah. it's a really wild possibility. I'm not saying that that's what I think is going to happen. But you're not hearing a lot of buzz like, oh, J Jonah Williams any day now. That's not going around. So I, I think it is interesting. And I know Oklahoma's remained in that race um, kind of quietly. Um, so we'll, let, let's just watch it. Like, I'm not, I don't want anybody to get kind of their hopes up right now. I, OU would not be my pick as things currently stand. But at the same time, I, I think there's a there's been a little bit of good fortune for OU this summer. We'll have to see how it kind of plays out. And not to mention that the you know the big elephant in the room with Jonah Williams is it might not even matter. He might end up being a first round yeah. draft pick in baseball, and this is all academic. We don't even really need to talk about it anymore because he's going to go on and play uh, major league baseball at some point. So uh, certainly something to watch, and it was something that you know as this 2025 cycle kind of quote unquote winds down it's going to be something that we'll definitely watch throughout the season as he goes into his senior year uh it should be interesting another guy that we've talked about it seems like some of these guys are getting repetitive because the numbers are kind of getting into a little bit of a crunch Lamont Rogers who made a midweek visit about two weeks ago to Dorbin and you know we had come on in the recruiting report in uh, I think the week after talking about his official visit Sounds like things are once again very positive for the Mesquite Horn offensive tackle. Yeah, you know, one of the Eddie, I mean, I wouldn't put him quite in the Phil Lodeholt case, but I mean, you saw him that morning in Georgia, yeah. I believe you did too. 
he is a mountain of a human being. Like I, I you know, he, I was told he came in at like three thirty at OU's camp, and he looked lean. You're yes. like that guy had to put on twenty, thirty more pounds, and it wouldn't even be a problem. And I know some of that just the the modern tackles are just absolute you know machines just unbelievable athletes but w- with Lamont I I really like the way this is trending with Oklahoma I put up a note this morning um I have been told he's going to announce this Saturday July 6th um if that decision were to happen right now I think it's Oklahoma that would be my guess that would be my bet I haven't I'm not so confident I'm ready to put in a prediction or anything like that but I do when you talk to people I kind of from all the angles of this, it sounds like Texas is pretty much out. It sounds like this is Oklahoma, Missouri, and A&M. When you talk to people at A&M and Missouri, I get the impression Missouri kind of thinks A&M's floundering a little bit. And when I talk to people at A&M, I think it's kind of Missouri. They think Missouri's kind of out of it. We always talk about it. What's the constant? What's the thing that remains? It's always Oklahoma. That you know, I think Missouri thinks they're competing against OU. I think A&M thinks they're competing against OU. My impression is that this is probably OU and Missouri are the most likely candidates here. Again, A&M, we know their resources. We know everything about it. You can't rule them out. I'm, I'm not telling you anything. Uh, you know, this is a two-horse race or anything like that. But if I'm guessing, those would be the two most likely. And I just really think Oklahoma did a great job with Mom, with Lamont. That official visit, guys, they kind of fluked into it, but you look through the weekends. You had uh, the first weekend was, um, oh, uh, Darius Afalava, who obviously Eddie and I talked to this week. Oh, you just already got him in the boat. The following week was Michael Fasusi. It was supposed to be Michael Fasusi and um, Haywood. No, I'm sorry. Haywood was the 21st. Uh, Yeah, you're right, George. You're right. It was supposed to be Haywood and Fasusi. That cancels out. So OU on two straight weekends got to put all their eggs kind of in one offensive lineman's basket. The next weekend, or the next midweek, is Lamont Rogers. Same deal. He's the entire focus. I mean, we saw it, Eddie. Brent Venables didn't leave mom's side. Bill Biedenboe was there. I mean, they they did. He got the full red carpet treatment. Yeah. And then the final weekend, it's Andrew Babalola. So some of it was to plan. Lamont changing his visit kind of was kind of a curveball. And obviously, Ty Haywood was not the plan. But it kind of worked out in a way where this may really pay off for OU and that they really got to isolate those guys and, you know, hey, you're our guy. We want you as part of this class. We're going to make this, you know, a great offensive line class. And with Darius Afalava, it's already paid off. And we know that OU seems to have made a real move, both with Lamont Rogers and Michael Fasusi on their official visits. Josh, we've talked a lot about that that big four that you just mentioned uh, of those offensive tackles in, in Haywood, Fasusi. Babaloa and, and and Rogers. Where is Rogers maybe in that group of four? And my second question is, could they get another one of those group of four if they were to get Rogers? Sure. The I would say probably if you're ranking like ceiling and floor is such a popular way to put it, and mm-hmm. I think it's very simple, kind of for people to understand. I would say Lamont Rogers probably has the lowest floor of the four. Like, I, I think that's that's a real thing because he is still, like I said, he's still got so much physical development to go through. And he's so long levered and all those things. Like, he's got, he's still growing into his body in a big way. Like, it, you just, you're not going to have all your tools at 18 when you're six foot seven and, you know, almost six foot eight. I mean, he's just an enormous human being. But if I also was going to say who has the highest ceiling, I think it might be Lamont Rogers. Cause like I said, it's kind of guys, when I watch him, it's kind of like watching Orlando Brown, except a much lighter version of him in high school. Because I remember, you know, what guys and we can, every OU fan out there can remember when he was coming out in the draft, everybody was like, Oh, he's too slow footed. Look at him run that 40. He can't do it. That's great. But when you have a seven foot three wingspan and you're six foot eight, good luck getting around him. Like if he's just there in the way, what are yeah. you going to do? And so Lamont Rogers is kind of the same deal, but I think he's a better athlete than Orlando was. So I, again, I, with a guy like Bill Beanbow, with we know his developmental track record, Lamont Rogers is a scary possibility to work with a guy like Bill that I think would really fine tune his game and could really, you know, kind of get him to his 90th percentile of play. Um, now, as far as your other question, George, I, I'm so torn. 
because everything in my brain, everything I knew about this situation told me the only way Oklahoma was going to get two is if Babalola was involved. The three Dallas guys were going to go in three different directions. Like That was everything I've been told since the spring. And now when you look at it, I know there have been discussions behind the scenes. And I think some of it was joking and half-hearted, but kind of a, well, which guy's going to go to right tackle? Like was almost the, the conversation amongst some of the guys. Um, so I, my guess is no. I don't think it's going to work out. But I do know it is a much more realistic realistic possibility. And I think the only school that has any chance of pulling it off is Oklahoma. And when we're talking about them maybe getting that second of that big four that we just spoke about, it's probably going to be Michael Fasusi is, is kind of that, that swing guy. As insane as that is to say, Eddie. Like, I mean, yeah. if, if, if you could have told OU fans that they were going to get Lamont Rodgers – Michael Fasusi, and oh yeah, Ryan Foje, who I think may have as much upside as any offensive tackle in the country. I, I don't. David Sanders is, I think, a top two player in the country. From a physical tool standpoint, Ryan Foje can play with anybody. Like I mean, he is special, special. And for him to be there with Rogers and Fasusi, guys, I, I, I don't know what you like. Bill Beatonbo, like that's a. There's a lot of people on the board that we're going to have to eat some crow if that's the way that goes because there has sure. been some heat. We know it. We've we've I all heard it. Crow. But that's an unbelievable class and just a, a credit not only to you know Beanbo and the staff, but Oklahoma's NIL has really I think stepped up here and done some things to help Oklahoma make this kind of possible. But guys, to me, if you ask me at this point, what's more likely? OU signs two of the three from Dallas or zero of the three, I would say it's two. I think they're going to get one. I'm almost certain of that. It's just a question of can they get two, and how do you make that work positionally? It's crazy because if, you know, even let's just say they get Rodgers. Uh, that's probably the best offensive line class. I'm, I'm kind of filtering through here, Josh, and you might be able to think of a better one than this. But like, while, you're, while you're looking at it, it would be Darius Afalava, who committed obviously last week, Owen Hollenbeck, who has kind of been the constant in this class of the offensive line. Ryan Foje, and then you add in one of those four. Right, and I think... Or it, possibly two. Or, I mean, if you get two, then it's probably the best offensive line class Bill Beanbow's ever put together in terms of rankings. But the 2015 class was really good. Bobby Evans, Cody Ford, and Drew Samia. Obviously, I, I don't think Cody Ford and Drew Samia were ranked as high, but obviously ended up being really good football sure. players. Bobby Evans as well. But Josh, it, I, I would assume it would be... Let's just say they add one of those four. It's the best offensive line class under Bill since. Well, on paper, you'd almost have to say 2020. That 2020, the Andrew yeah. Rain, Aaron, uh, Anton Harrison, Aaron Parks. Well, I mean, and but that's what's crazy is because Anton Harrison was the afterthought in that group, guys. Sure. He was not the guy that everybody was excited about. Uh, it was Aaron Parks. It was Andrew Rain. Like, you know, you go down the list. Uh, Noah Nelson. Was uh, oh, the. Yeah, Nate, uh, you had Noah Nelson and Nate Anderson. Nate yep. Anderson from Frisco uh, uh, Reedy was a guy that a lot of people really loved. And I, I include myself. He was a super athletic guy. Uh, I was always kind of surprised it didn't work out for him. But that that's the interesting thing because that's almost the immediate turnabout. Well, yeah, every time OU's recruited well, it, it, the guys haven't always panned out. You know, the Bray Walker, some of that stuff. Bill's almost had more luck with the guys who were kind of the overachiever or the underrated, you know, however you want to look at it. So that's going to be the interesting part of this equation. But at the same time, I think it. so many of these guys that we're talking about are projectable offensive linemen. Like Lamont Rogers is not the eighth best offensive tackle, or I think we've got him number seven um, in the country as a player right now. But in time, he could be the number one guy. Like, I mean, that that is that is a avenue of possibility so we've got to like i said I, I don't want everybody to think all oh, these guys are going to come in and start next year i don't think that's the case for any of them save for maybe off of lava like i would watch him like he's interesting because he's just so big and powerful and uh, you know that interior line uh, i you know you don't know i i could just see something working out i think the tackles are going to need a year they'll need some time but it, like i said if you get Afalava, Hollenbeck, Foje, and either Rogers or Fasusi. I mean, that's 
on paper, I think that's a, that's a better class than 2020 because you have more elite type potential in that group than I think maybe you did in uh, in 2020. But at the same time, you know, is there there's still some questions? I still would like to see OU get a fifth if I'm being honest. But it seems like four is kind of what they're thinking, unless it's probably Michael Fasusi. Let's go here to close. Oklahoma, as it stands now, 20 commitments in the 2025 class, number nine nationally in the on-three team rankings, fifth in the SEC. If you could bump into that top four of the SEC all of a sudden, I think you're probably talking about conservatively, just taking a guess, Josh, you're probably going to end up being five and seven in the country. Maybe you could finish with the top five class. Pretty unbelievable. Would it just be too easy to say that, oh, they're going to the SEC, so they're getting some of these guys that they just hadn't been? Well, I would I would also say, because I, I, everybody here is fifth in the SEC, it's really close. Other than, like, Georgia, mm-hmm. I think all those those other kind of four, th- four teams, maybe even Alabama, like, they're, you're you're like really close to having the same sure like number and and in some you know obviously on three but like you look at others too it's like the OU's in some places a little bit higher or a little bit lower so but uh, I I mean sorry I cut you off no I Josh that I, I think just, that like the, it's very close the question would be like what is realistically like how high could this class finish yeah. Ohio State's class is really the only one where you look at it and you're like, I don't think Oklahoma's catching that. Like, there's, they're, you know, like four, like three and a half points on the score on, you know, the on, on three team rankings. But everybody else, guys, I mean, like, you get, I mean, less than a point and a half, and Oklahoma's the number five class in the country and number four in the SEC. Like, it's not a big reach. And that's the thing, like, people will lose sight of and they'll say, oh, yeah, they'll make a bump because of, you know, say they get, you know, Rogers, Robinson, Fasusi, you know, they get some of these high name guys that are going to move, you know, kind of their class, you know, the lower ranked guys in their class down and push them up. That's great. But people will kind of say, oh, well, you know, what happens when the other schools do? Yeah, that's going to happen. But you look at Ohio State or, you know, some of these other schools that are like Alabama's already got 20 commitments. Most of their guys are already factored in. Like most of their top guys are already going to be part of that equation. Now, there's a few exceptions. But I don't think there's as much volatility to how they can move because, like, say Michael Vasusi jumps in the in the boat, you know, number three offensive tackle in the country, I think number twelve overall player. That is going to make a big move because the player he's replacing in the current rankings would be, a, you know, like a mid three star, like a Malik Hawkins kind of guy. And that, you know, no shot at Malik Hawkins. Don't mean yeah, single. Yeah, we talked out. about how impressive. I just we mean were to kind of, yeah, you know what I mean. Just to kind of give some perspective to people. So that's going to be a big jump because the average, you know, what's being entered into the mathematical equation there is very, very different. We'll have, uh, if it if it gets really dicey, we'll get one of those uh, easels out and you can do all the math hand by yeah, hand. I, I won't be doing that, uh, but uh, maybe I got could, kicked out of college do that to Josh, but I, I do then think I it's, it's going. it is kind of crazy though to sit here. And I, I think I said this on fine bomb, but like Brent's, have, has a really good chance that I would say that they are going to land a top 10 class. I, sure. I feel comfortable saying that unless obviously some guys decommit or they don't land some of these guys we're talking about. That'd be four straight top 10 classes well, it, under it, Brent Venables, which it's, Lincoln Riley, I don't believe ever did. It's repetitive to a certain sense that I think all we needed to know about this staff just in general as recruiters was being able to keep that thing together after the first year. Yeah. After the sixth and seventh season. Yeah. I mean, they kept it together. We're able to get these guys into campus when I think a lot of people from the outside looking in were thinking, what a failure this is. You know, this first year has not gone well. They're going to lose guys. I mean, it was after the uh, the kid from Austin, the defensive end uh, from, what was it, Westlake that ended up. Uh, Bossick. Yeah, Colton yeah, Bossick, Colton Bossick. Yeah. that ended up decommitting. And it was like, oh, boy, here yeah. they go. They're gonna they're getting ready to lose this entire class. And they never were able to, or, you know, fortunately, we're, they they kept it together, right? So I I think that, that we learned a little bit about kind of the uh, the sauce that they have at that point. Well, and I think the thing that we've we've known from probably the start of the v- Brent Venables era is that we all felt pretty confident in their ability to recruit. Sure, like this is a staff that we we feel confident that they can recruit not only the top level players that we've seen, but also go out and find maybe some gems that other people didn't see at first, and. The big question now is, you know, what does it look like on the field? And sure. that's kind of what, 
you know, we're going to find out this year and, and next year and in the, in the coming years is can they coach on the field, obviously develop some of these players they've brought in, it seems like. And track record would say, you know, for somebody like a Todd Bates, yeah, that, yes. that 2024 defensive line class is going to – develop mature right. and end up being big time players for Oklahoma so it, so that's that's what gives you again that's what when we, we talk about this all the time is is the long-term trajectory of the program mm -hmm. you have belief in it because I mean you've seen it in college football the, the lifeblood of your program is recruiting and Oklahoma's done a really good job at that we had uh, Mike Bratton and uh, yesterday talking uh, you know all the SEC stuff uh, we talked to Paul Feinbaum yesterday about it it still surprises me to a certain extent, just to kind of close this thing out, and this is more on like the team side of things, how surprised people were with the Brent Venables extension. I, I'm still a little bit blown away by this idea that so many people from the outside looking in were a little bit surprised by the commitment from Oklahoma. And, and I, I get Mike's point yesterday saying that, you know, you'd like to see what he does in the SEC before you make that commitment, but OU's always been this way sure. you know when they believe in a coach or they believe um in, in a program they invest in it yeah. uh you've seen that whether it's projects or coaches or extensions whatever it may be joe casiglone has been very open about that and, and i get that it's head scratching to some and even i think some of us were a little bit um you know taken back by it but i do think they believe in the long-term trajectory of this thing and my other point is you know if it doesn't work with brent um they're going to find a way to buy out whatever that contract is. Just like every other major college football program in the sure. country, if Brent totally fails this next year or the next two years and OU wants to go in a different direction, they will come up with whatever money they have to to move on from him. Like the Oklahoma is not any different than any other program. What a what a uh, kind of negative way to end this. Program, <laughs> I know because I, it's been so positive. I know, and I again, I I believe I I I believe in Brent, and like sure. I said, I I think the the recruiting has has not been this good in a long time. At least it seems like, um, from my perspective, the it consistency does, of it. Josh, it does seem like there's been a lot of positive here over the last, you know, let's just say six months. It it really does, and it's it's like I said so often on you know on official visit weekends. You hear the stuff like, oh, it sounds good, it sounds good. Oklahoma was not trending with Lamont Rogers. They were not trending with Michael Fasusi. They going into the visits, Omarion Robinson flat out said Oregon was his leader. Like Oklahoma deserves I don't know what they did at the, you know, if there was anything that different this year with their official visits, but what they did made a real impact. It wasn't just, oh, they secured their lead with guys they were already gonna get. And George, I will say, going back, I had to look. Not since oh, like um, oh two through oh six was the last time that wow. Oklahoma was consistently back. You know, I think that was five in a row. But that's the last time they recruited top ten classes at this clip. If they can get another one this year, because that seventeen through nineteen, Riley had three in a row. But like you said, he twenty twenty. I think they ended up thirteenth, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So it is. I mean, this is this is historic territory. And I think, guys, the perfect way to wrap it up is talking about awful lava. He flat out said I, it was the SEC. Eddie asked him yeah. about it. You know, how big a deal was that? I was looking at LSU and Tennessee, and then I found out OU was going to be in the SEC. And I was like, okay. And then he just canceled those trips. Now, I don't know what kind of news services in Utah that he didn't find out OU was going to the SEC until two years later. We're not going to get into that part of it. But – OU being in the SEC clearly impacted his recruitment. It, it, what's, what's crazy, and we'll end on this positive note, when he says 02 through 06, those classes ended up competing for national championships in 2003, 2004, and obviously that 06 class went on to compete for the national championship in 2008. So I'm not saying OU is going to go compete for national titles because it is a different – college football has totally changed sure. since then with the portal and, and everything else that goes into that. I, I think it's very – open in terms of teams that can come in and compete for national titles but uh it certainly is is a good sign just need a panther 2006 <laughs> class had a panther just you know this one needs one i don't know if there's much over there right now rather depressing all right very good josh we uh appreciate it and uh it'll be interesting over the weekend marion robinson as well as lamont rogers expected to make announcements coming up this weekend and who knows we might be uh, reconvening after the holiday and going with, uh, you know, 22 commitments as they stand right now at 20. What a, just real quick, 4th of July is a big holiday. 
It's a great holiday. Where are you going with this? Grill items. Oh. Hot dog. I thought you were going to do some conspiracy here. (laughs) No, there's nothing conspiracy conspiracy driven about the 4th of July unless you're not a believer. Um, I love hot dogs. I'm a big hot dog guy. Mm -hmm. I know Bob is a big hot guy, hot dog guy too. Um, but I think I have to go with a hamburger on the 4th of July though. Switch it up a little bit. Yeah. Why can't you do both? I mean, you can, you, I mean, I'm going, I think you should do both, but if you had to, I'm saying if you had to pick one, I think a, a great burger on the grill on the 4th of July with some watermelon. Yeah. Oh, can't be. Absolutely. It. Maybe a little vodka in that watermelon. Josh, are you going to be uh, grilling out this week? Yeah, uh, we'll have something out. Uh, probably we, we almost have like two days of festivities. Like we do the fourth and the fifth because there's different firework shows going on at different oh, yeah. times. It's a whole deal. Um, but yeah, I think uh, one day we might do like some pulled pork, you Ooh. know, for one of the days. And then yes. I think on the on the fifth will actually be when we do like hot dogs. Hot dogs, hamburgers. We're going to be out at my in-laws. My um, my father-in-law is very, very much hot dogs and hamburgers are the only things allowed to be served during a 4th of July event, even on the 5th of July. But that's, you know, again, I'm not here to question the man. The 4th on a Thursday, falling on a Thursday. It's amazing. Best best day of the year. Best day of the year. All right. That's going to do it. Appreciate you joining us here on the Suterscoop.com YouTube page. For Josh, George, I'm Eddie. We'll see you next time.